Hello, welcome to Art Show. I'm Craig Stover, and today I have with me Jean Rees. Hey, how are you today? Hi, how are you? Hi. Good. I was looking forward to talking to you. I went on your website and looked at your work, and I wanted to share a few images of yours. I got I got lots of questions for you about this. Um, so I wanted to share some images of yours first, because there's more people who don't know who you are than people <laughs> do. So this piece figures prominently on your on your site, and I can see why. Um, <laughs> it's it's a stunning piece. I really like this one. Thank um, you. Tell me a little bit about this. Uh, so this is a quilt made out of synthetic braiding hair. Um, I did a residency back in May with a group of other textile artists of like knitters and quilters. So I became very inspired by the kind of the history of quilt making. Uh, amongst African Americans, especially during slavery and their relation to the Underground Railroad and things like that. Um, specifically, also looking at uh, the way cornrows were once braided during slavery could be used as a message or a map, and then thinking of how quilts could be hung outside of uh, safe houses during the Underground Railroad. So, want to kind of combine the two. <laughs> so, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. Um, the knotting process of this because you 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 pegged it you, you, you beat me to the punch essentially um so there are uh, there can be messages within the knotting and I was curious to know ha have you put any messages in this piece no this okay. piece was very much like I had an idea I was like I want to make a quilt out of hair don't know how I'm gonna do it but okay. went for it <laughs> um I just wanted it to have some type of general center. So it, that's why I had the four different colors in the center. Just okay. the focal point. But that's my um, next question. <laughs> general. Yeah. Sorry. I'm beating. Uh, but yeah, in general, it was very like I was just figuring it out as I went along. Yeah. When you did this, were you like in the zone? Uh yes. This yeah. took me about like two months. Yeah. To make um because I had to braid out all the hair individually and then sew those together into the, like the individual squares and then sew all those together it does look like a labor of love i would love to see this thing in person i, I think it's really great but that leads me to my next piece um mm -hmm. yeah go ahead uh, so <laughs> this is this is uh, like a handmade paper piece with, with yes what? what am i looking at Yes. Um, so this kind of also goes along with the quilt. I actually did this series before the quilt. Um, I was, again, exploring the idea of hair as maps and being used as a means to escape enslavement um, and thinking of how they would sow, uh, the runaways would sow things like seeds and gold and trinkets into their hair so that when they did reach liberation, they had something to kind of start with. Um, so I was also thinking of the very like old school, like vintage kind of maps. Um, and I wanted it to be very like a lay of the land sort of feel. Uh, so this is handmade paper in which I deposed a imprint of a braid into the wet paper pulp and uh, filled in some of the lines with rice and gold ink. It, it has a it has like a potential storyline, like a hidden storyline for me that yeah. I would love to look more into to 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 figure out what it is. As soon as you talk about gold within the braids, ooh, that's another layer. I really yeah. I really like that. How many of these are there? This is a series. There is currently twenty two of these. Currently, does that mean you're still producing? Oh, these I did again at my residency also. So this is, I did the quilt after the residency, but okay. I did it during that time um, because I had access to like a real like paper studio, okay. had all the tools. Um, and at that time I was making them just kind of like average, like very small or like normal eight by 11 type sheets. Uh, Cause I had to think about bringing them home. Uh, but then I had a friend who actually made me some super extra large paper decals a while ago so when I came back and had a better idea of how to make my paper pulp with everything at home I'm now trying to blow them up to much bigger okay pieces. so it's kind of a series that you've started yeah. and stopped and started and yeah improving upon oh I'd love to see the, yeah. the, the next ones on me so this piece in particular this is what I've I first was exposed to when when seeing your work 
Um, this is a stunning piece. And what what was interesting to me, it's 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 kind of like a twofer because mm -hmm. you have the piece that you've made that you're wearing, but then this is a uh, an image that you have then made into a print edition. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so you see what I'm saying about two for there. Yeah. <laughs> double double duty on it. Yeah. So I'm tell me about the one. tell me about the mask part of it. Like so, where does that originate from? Uh so the mask is completely made out of synthetic grading hair. Um and decorated with beads and other hair accessories. Um, it is inspired by African elephant mask, which was known to only be kind of worn for ceremonies for like the higher royals of the tribe. Uh, so and, Africa is huge. Where in Africa is that? So I believe it's in like Western Africa, but most of the mask I started creating was mostly created because I was just looking at, um, I did like the DNA ancestry kit. So I started looking at the different regions of Africa that populated for me. And then from there, looking at different masks that are from those different regions. Um, I believe I want to say this one's kind of like, because I have like Nigeria, Cameroon, Congo. I think this one is part more so from that area, Cameroon, Congo, Western Bantu people, um, Mali, Senegal. Okay, <laughs> so it was basically <laughs> like all of mostly like Western Central Africa. Um so what that's was, kind of what was it about about the elephant mask to begin with? Was it was it the content that attracted you, or was it the the shape? Like a lot of artists are shape or color or form. So it wasn't necessarily the color or shape or anything, but more so the meaning of it. Um, because uh, so the elephant mask I found was only worn for like like I said, higher royal courts of the tribe. Um, and before slavery, how you wore and styled your hair could rep would represent what tribe you were from, your rank in the community, your marital status, your age, so forth. Um, so I kind of wanted to combine those two ideas. And they were mostly worn for the higher courts because like the beading in the, like, the original mask was ex known to be expensive because they had to get it imported. So that's why I wanted to kind of add the beading and the jewels on this one. And yeah. <laughs> Stunning piece. Uh who, who got you to do the prints? Was that a, an idea that you had or? Um, I have a friend I went to college with who's now a uh, pretty, like a, he's like more of a, he's a great photographer. Um, and I had him do the shots for me. Um, and the great idea. He gave me the tips to yeah. make. <laughs> yeah. I was so this, this piece that we're looking at, this is a, is this a little bit earlier before the last piece? Yes. Um, so mostly I started with my pieces just being three dimensional on the wall. Um, and then I wanted to find a way to bring them like to life a little bit more, uh, bringing them off the wall. Um, so these were, again, just inspired by various uh, African masks. Uh, this particularly was a Walu antelope mask, which is why I have like the kind of uh, horns on the top. Um, it's probably the biggest mask I've made, but I literally just use chicken wire and synthetic braiding hair. Mm -hmm. And I like cut a generic shape into the chicken wire and then weave the braids in between it. Mm. I but really I have, love the shapes and especially the square eyes. They're just Yeah. <laughs> some of them, some of them are very inspired directly by African mask, and some of them I just kind of get an idea. A little bit of a uh, combination. Yeah. So I wanted to show this one too, because this yeah. is this is also this. I am I guessing right that this is one of your most popular images. Uh yeah. Because <laughs> it's uh, it stops you in your tracks. I really love it. So tell me a little bit about the. I'm I'm curious about the nodding up at the top because this is different than your other works. It seems more elevated, more. Um, you know, you have the fade from the green to the yellow in that. that that's not mm -hmm. something that you really had before. And so was this you experimenting or was this because of like research that you realized that you could do this? Um. So the, no, so like um, I kind of just started looking at different styles. I would see like my friends wear or different styles. I would see other women of color wearing on social media. And I think at the time I was wearing these, a lot of people were doing like these little puffs at the end of their braids. So that's kind of where those came inspired from. 
Um, the general style of the mask was inspired by a mask I that was like on like the research page of like my ancestry page of like the Cameron Congo people. So it was one that was very similar to this, but it had way more like horns at the top and like a very, they were like the bottom part went down to like their feet. So it was a more like full body costume. So I was kind of mimicking that. And my original idea was for it to be all green, but I ended up finding this hair that was already like multicolored and I hadn't played with color yet in that way. Right. I was doing like very solid colors. Um, so this was kind of, yeah, experimental for me in a sense too, because I was like doing more than just braiding. I was like making little, using the little rubber bands to like puff up the ends and the hair is like wrapped around a thicker braid at the very top. Um, so yeah, a lot of layers went into this, but yeah, the color was definitely me more experimenting and mm. just kind of, yeah, once I started going with them, they just kind of like developed themselves. <laughs> <laughs> right it takes <laughs> over I, yeah, I totally do. <laughs> yeah so um tell me uh, i'm curious to know um about your start as an artist so a uh, question i asked a lot of artists was what was your first exposure to art did you do you have a memory as being a kid something that just hit you like a thunder clap uh -huh. So not necessarily a kid, but I guess a kid. Uh, I got kind of, when I was in middle school and high school, um, I was still in that era where like they chose your classes for you, um, so to speak. So you just went the first day and got your roster. And the like my first day of 10th grade, I found out I was in a ceramics class. <laughs> and I was like, what the heck is ceramics? <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, like I had no idea. I literally had no idea what it was. Um, but they, they wouldn't let me get out of it. I was I actually tried to get out of it and they wouldn't let me. Um, and then I ended up having a natural talent for it. It's a divine providence. <laughs> <laughs> I had a natural talent for it so much so that my teacher thought I did it before, specifically with hand Bill. building. Um, yeah. And then, um, I honestly had no intention or on being an artist, like it really? was not in the plans at all. Um, I, kept taking ceramics um, throughout high school. They actually let me take it more than once because my teacher was able to start giving me side projects and I just needed a class to fill my schedule. Um, and they all thought like, oh, she's probably going to go to art school. But um, I ended up going to Lincoln University undecided. And then I was a psychology major for all of a semester. Okay. <laughs> uh, then I went to mass communications. And then I became an art major when I found out the school had a ceramic studio. <laughs> I just like jumped back into it. And then it kind of took off from there. Default, um, default. Yeah. <laughs> like, so but you had the passion was... for it. I mean, you had, clearly you had a drive to continue uh, this kind of yeah. thing. So at what point, so you, you went to college and yeah. then it wasn't until late in your undergrad that you decided to go to art. And then you went to grad school. Yeah. for art at, at more and from then on it was just yeah. smooth sailing yeah I didn't okay. I was I was basically like the friend uh like when we were graduating college I was the one in a group that was very much like I'm not done with school I'm not going back to grad school I ended up being the only one that went back to school um so I went to more yes for my master's in studio art which is when I really was able to branch out from just ceramics um, which at undergrad, we had to have like more of a focused area. Um, but at more, it was like we had access to like the wood shop in the ceramic studio and the 3D lab and like all these different things and learning how to just use random material found items and things like that. And during the time I started to um, decide to lock my hair. So then that started to just play a mm -hmm. hole in my practice and journey and everything but yeah originally being an artist was not a part of it I didn't know exactly <laughs> what I was going to do <laughs> so uh I'm curious to know about your processes like how this goes about in particular um like I'm I'm curious to know like when you go to make a work of art is it do you already have an idea in your head or, you know, how, how much of it is like 
poof, I've got this idea and how much of it is I'm working with these materials and it's guiding me in this direction? Um, It's more the more like a poof, like light bulb moment is it? for me. Um, okay. yeah, I, I am very much into like history and I like to kind of research, especially the more I think I got into that more, especially in grad school when we had to research our projects mm -hmm. and things. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm very, I very much like to learn like the history of things, um, especially Black culture and history of just like in general. Do um, you have Do you have a like research library in your home? Like, how many? <laughs> is it mostly just online, or or do you actually search out books? Or no, it's it's both. I I love okay. a good book. I love a good book. Um, I like to like I'm one of those people when I'm reading, especially like a research book, I highlight and annotate things like little notes to keep to myself. Um, but also, I think a lot of my work can be very spiritual, especially the more I start diving into my own ancestry, because a lot of my ideas for my math will come to me like in dream. State. Okay. Do you do you and keep it like a journal? You not necessarily. Journal by Sometimes no? I not necessarily. Like, I don't hop up and then instantly write but it down. You, you remember the dream. I remember it. Okay. But it's mostly most of my projects are like I have a very I'll get a very visual of what I want to make. And it's like, okay, I know what is one what, what I want it to look like, but then it's more so for me it becomes the fun part. It's like, okay, but how am I gonna make it? Right. And then that's when like the more experimental thing comes in. It's like at, at, at what point you know, if you've got an idea or even a general idea and you're working on something, you know, do you, do you, do you find that you just keep working on the piece until it gets as close as possible to your dream? Or are there, are there times when you say give up or <laughs> just like, no, this isn't working or you start over? Um, yeah, I have those moments. Like with the quilt, I had that moment. Um, Like I started it one way and then it just kept looking like more of a rug and then I had to <laughs> start all over. <laughs> um but a lot of times like I'll just experiment with making things like a little smaller before I make it into a larger scale so that I have a better idea of like how to go about it. Um but it doesn't happen too often. Normally So, so yeah. I, I'm curious where where do you get your materials from? Like the bulk oh. of your materials? Oh uh, the beauty supply store. Okay. Um, do you have one that's close to you or do you I have several that are okay. Close to me. Only be, um, you know, I asked that question because I'm surprised by some of the answers I've been getting from artists. I a lot of artists have turned to like Facebook Marketplace and yeah. like online. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's convenient because uh I go to like the local beauty supply store where like most women will get a good like wig or weave where they have lashes and makeup mm -hmm. and everything else so literally everything I used to create my mask and my things I bought at the beauty supply store um or already had laying around the house the only other material that I've been using outside of that really is the chicken wire for the more like wall mm -hmm. like, do you ever incorporate say your own hair no 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 that's <laughs> for, <laughs> just curious you know like, no, kind of no, wondering no. Where I haven't done that yet. Um, also, because like I feel like with especially with real hair, it um has more of a spiritual connection, and that's across multiple like I know cultures as far as like letting your hair getting the wrong hands of someone. Mm -hmm. So I don't really necessarily work with real hair. I know other artists do, so mad respect to them. But personally, for me, I like the convenience of being able to use synthetic hair because I could do a lot more with it. In is it sense. more pliable um a little bit it depends because like you could buy different textures too and everything like some of there might already come wavy but um it's almost like working with like rope or string a little bit because once I braid it or twist it or whatever I can just kind of literally maneuver it and a way like you would like string or any other textile type thread how many different knots do you think you know offhand <laughs> i don't really know knots necessarily because everything okay. literally just or weaving patterns yeah i've never studied every any type of weaving patterns okay any type of techniques All I right. took home ec class in like middle school <laughs> so a lot of these textures are are invented yeah in a sense i guess because i'm just braiding the hair and then 
I sew it together as best I can in just whatever general way you'll get the job done for it to hold it together. <laughs> <laughs> well, it works. It really works. Um, uh, so this is a, a specific question for you. Do you, when you're making your work, do you think about your audience at all when you're making the work or is the work more about you're the audience? Um, A little of both because like my work is or can be very narrative. So there's very storytelling, but I think it's not just my story to tell. I think I'm telling a story just kind of in general of like black culture through hair mm -hmm. um, and just how much our hair relates to our identity and how we identify as ourselves in this economy or society I should say um so yeah no I don't think too much into that normally I get very so much you get to the art show <laughs> yeah like I, I mean I, I guess when I get to the art show but I try not to think about that too much because then I don't like to get caught up in like who am I trying to impress with it versus like what am I trying to say with this work yeah I don't I don't think it's an impressed thing I, yeah. I'm just saying that you know when you're when you're a lot of artists I find when they have a storyline they they're 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 inventing the story for themselves uh but also, there's other artists that do the opposite. They don't want themselves included at all. And they're trying to make objects that are outside of them. I think mine are more like focused. Like, I guess they are focused like on a journey of self, but okay. a journey like I know other people of color can relate to um, as far as their hair journey or things like I, that. And just I'm, telling his, his story, like speaking on history a little bit too. Right. So does... Do your works, is there any sort of autobiographical narrative in them at all? I mean, you you did say that there's dreams that end up becoming works. Well, they're all kind of relatable to me in a sense, because like I said, they're all inspired by the different regions of Africa I found populated in my own ancestry DNA. Okay. And then also it's just been me since I decided to lock my hair, it's been a journey of like me learning more about black hair and black hair culture that I never even knew growing up and kind of like resharing that history and knowledge um, because I know other people have kind of been on the same journey of self and yeah just kind of you know learning more about where we've come from and how where we come come from plays a part in who we are now mm -hmm. so yeah in that sense yeah. Uh, have you ever experienced, because you, when I first saw your work, I, 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 I thought what probably a lot of people do, because I, you know, just seeing a little bit of it was, which was fiber artist, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't, as soon as I, I looked at more of your work, I don't think of you as a fiber artist at all. I think of more of a multimedia artist kind of a thing or multidisciplinary yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah, I've been going more so with the multidisciplinary lane. I think lately because a lot of my work, like my, I've been more, I think I have become obsessed with hair as a medium over the last few years. Um, so I've just always curious, like what more can I do with this material? But I do play around with like other materials. Like I made the paper because like mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of step away from right. the hair for a second um because I don't want it to become like I don't want my practice to become like too stagnant on like okay. one thing either because like for now for the next couple of years it might be hair and then I might discover something completely else who knows <laughs> but do, don't you find that your your previous work even if you do make changes that the previous work still has an influence on yeah newer work yeah. anyway yeah, yeah there's a, it's like you can't get rid of it it's always yeah something's kind of creeping in yeah, it's always something creeping into it. It's just a matter of like finding new ways to go about yeah. presenting it too. So, so does that does that mean that you're maybe looking at um or ever toyed with say like photography or poetry or or other mediums? Um, I definitely and think have been thinking about toying with photography a little bit. Um, and I definitely would like to revisit an uh, installation I did for my uh, graduate thesis, uh, which kind of focused in the same area, but it also mostly focused on uh, 
not just beauty, but like body image and the influence of like body imagery mm. in modern day, especially among women. Um, mm. So I would like to revisit that installation because I still have a lot of materials from that. And now that I have kind of some more access to some spaces. We can do a part two when you, when you yeah. get into that. Because I would definitely two. love to see, especially going through the different works that I've seen of yours to revisit something new, revisit something new, uh, would be really yeah. <laughs> quite fascinating. When you're in your studio, how, how often are you in your studio? Well, so I don't have like the studio in a traditional sense. I am, I mean, I use my basement for a yeah. studio in a sense. Um, I use it a little less these days just because um, most of my practice has just been me just needing to sit and braid or so. No, the world is your studio. Basically, I could yeah. anyway, uh -huh. for the most part. Um, but most of my work, um, I get it done just like sitting and binging a show on uh -huh. multitasking. So let me guess that if you, you couldn't work in a quiet room, do you need something else going on? Yeah, I can't. I can't work in a quiet room. I'm also probably one of those artists who will have like the TV on, but also might have like music playing in one ear. Yeah. Yeah. Kind I of, found that that really helps like the subconscious come out. Like it, it occupies your mind. And... It, yeah. I feel like cause it's, I, I don't know what it does for me exactly, but it makes me focus more in some way, but also like, not take it like not get so immersed that I'm like completely tuned out from the world which mm -hmm. I know a lot of artists like to be completely tuned out but for me I don't know and it's also something I saw like I think I saw like him like radiant child with Basquiat and he used to be in his studio with like music playing tv on newspaper and books everywhere and things like that and I'm like a multitasker so I think I work kind of how my brain operates Mm -hmm. do you do you work on multiple pieces at the same time no <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the kiss of death <laughs> <laughs> no i cannot um it's I've definitely one that, at a time i've had more of that capability in grad school because i had the pressure of like more like exact deadlines to get something done but the bigger my pieces have be been becoming and the more labor intensive they're becoming I like I couldn't work on anything else until I finished that quilt like because if I, I would get too distracted on like the next thing instead so of, what do you do with the ideas that pop up in your head while you're working on I it? keep you a just... little sketchbook a okay little sketchbook, all right and I jot things down so I have like other things I've been starting to work on um but in general yeah I'll keep like a little notebook so when the idea does pop my head I'll like jot it down even if I don't start working on it for have you ever shown anybody those notebooks um or they they're like no hidden. that's just for me or, yeah. no like they're not hidden I mean I haven't okay. shown anybody but it's just like my note I just book I just keep it in my bag to mm -hmm. just like research notes kind of a yeah. thing it doesn't mean anything to anybody but you yeah right exactly so um this has been really an eye opener. Now I get to go back and look at your work in a different way, which I always love doing. Um, I have time for just one more question. And mm -hmm. it's a question I love asking artists. Real simple. You ready? <laughs> what does making art do for you? Oh, what does making art do for me? Um, for me, it helps me kind of like literally relax and relate <laughs> to the world around me um it helps me kind of gives me a minute of pause to just it's very actually therapeutic for me for my practice is very therapeutic for me and my mental health it helps me kind of just sit down focus on one task and not be so worried about like if it gets messed up or this or that um yeah, for me, my practice is just also just the continuous journey of self. And it sounds to me like maybe if you don't do art for a while, do you get like a little itchy or a little, yeah, little, things get strange? A little bit, a little bit. Like I, like the quilt took me a while. So since that, I've kind of been like the past month or so, I've been like on a, I haven't been making much, just took like kind of a little break. Um but I've been, I still kind of keep my hands busy babbling on like little ideas, making like miniatures or little things here and there. So. Well, I can't wait. Someday I, I'm going to be able to get out of his <laughs> studio. and come, I want to come see your work in person. I think it's great. 
So, uh, Dijon, I really want to thank you for coming by today and talking with me about my work. It's great. I love having these conversations because I've I've learned a lot, you know, just in this (laughs) short little bit of time. And I love the idea that just even the smallest thing helps me shift my focus on how I'm seeing your work. So, again, thank you very much. I also want to thank everybody else who tuned in to watch today. Really appreciate your uh, support. Please like and subscribe. That helps encourage us and allows more people to see these videos. And if you have any questions, feel free to just put them in the comments box. If I can't figure it out, I'll pass them along to the artists. So thanks again, everybody, for tuning in today. And again, thank you for coming. Have a great day.